And okay. I'm, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm, I'm Jonathan Trobe, and I'm coming to you from the University of Michigan. And I'm going to speak to you about the swollen optic disc and here we Good morning, everyone. This is Jonathan Trobe. I'm speaking to you from Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is in the Midwestern part of the United States. And my topic today is the swollen optic disc. I have formulated this as a dance in five steps, which means that you will have five steps to approach the formulation of the swollen optic disc. The first thing that we have to clear up is language. Uh, in English, when we say swollen, we usually mean that the optic disc is edematous. And that will mean that the patient has an acquired process. If we use the term elevated, that could mean either a congenital or an acquired process. So you can see that there is a distinction here. In general, most physicians, most ophthalmologists use the term swollen. The problem is that if you use that term, you are automatically implying that the patient has an acquired process and you all know that many swollen discs actually are congenital. So I suggest to you that an alternative, not always very popular, but a little bit more rigorous is using the term anomalous optic disc elevation when you mean congenital and acquired optic disc elevation when you mean acquired. All right, well, let's, with those terms in mind, let's get to the first step of the analysis. And obviously the first step is whether or not the, the optic disc elevation is congenital, because if it is, clearly the workup is going to be very much different. Uh, what, you, what you know and what I know about congenital optic disc elevation is that the patient typically has no visual symptoms. And this is a finding that is, is made incidentally in your office. The patient can have monocular or binocular optic disc elevation and visual function will usually be normal. That is not always true. And you know the major exception here is optic disc drusen, which can be um, very important in uh, in, in damaging visual function. But the general rule is visual function will usually be normal. The question is whether ophthalmoscopy itself is enough to help you decide whether or not the disc is congenitally elevated or has acquired optic disc elevation. And do you need to have ancillary imaging? So let me show you in the next slide uh, a series of two pictures here the one on the left and the one on the right. And I would ask you to look at them and determine just from looking at them, which one is congenital and which one is acquired. And I will tell you that there's one of each. All right, after giving it a moment's look here, I'm sure you will be, will agree with me that this is a very difficult assessment. It turns out that the one on the left is congenital and the one on the right is acquired. So let us talk briefly about the signs of congenital optic disc elevation. Well, the first feature is that the nerve fiber layer is generally distinct. And here is that example showing you that if you looked at the margins of the optic discs, you would generally see that they have a distinct border. You know that that's not always the case and it can be very difficult. So we move on to the next feature, which is that typically the congenital optic disc does not have a physiologic cup. And here you can see that there is no physiologic cup in the center. And we often speak of the elevation as being dome shaped rather than as Americans would say, donut shaped. So that there's a depression in the center. A depression in the center, which is a little bit visible here, is somewhat more typical of acquired optic disc elevation. Again, you can see that the distinction is not always easy. The optic disc vessels in congenital optic disc elevation are often tortuous and there are often too many of them. And you can see that shown here where the optic disc uh, vasculature looks like it's excessive. And that's because there are vascular anomalies that go along with the optic disc elevation. 
Spontaneous venous pulsations may be present, but are typically not present in either condition. If you do see spontaneous venous pulsations, you know that you are at least not dealing with increased intracranial pressure. No leakage on fluorescein angiogram in papilledema, uh, I'm sorry, in congenital optic disc elevation, and there will be some typically in papilledema. So that is a helpful distinction. Drusen, uh, as you know, are often present, but the rule is that many congenitally optic discs, many congenitally optic anomalously, congenitally anomalous optic discs do not have optic disc drusen. So don't expect to always find them. But if you are in the search for optic disc drusen, you have a choice of several ancillary studies. And here I'm showing you the four favorite ancillary studies that are used. Fluorescence, autofluorescence photography, which you can see is really quite effective in showing you optic distrusion, even those that are buried. Uh, B-scan ultrasound is quite good. Computed tomography, you can see the, the little white dots here of the uh, calcified drusen in the optic disc. And then the most effective of all, optic coherence tomography, which nowadays is the favorite uh, tool because it's readily available and will give you the answer quite readily. One point to keep in mind here is that the optic disc uh, of, of myopia, which is tilted often, uh, can uh, masquerade as acquired optic disc elevation. You have to be very careful. Keep uh, in mind that it's usually on the nasal side, but this uh, will be a major confounder. All right, now we're ready for step two. If indeed you believe that the optic disc elevation is acquired, your job is to try to figure out what caused it. And let me briefly comment on the important causes of acquired optic disc elevation. So number one is increased intracranial pressure, which we call papilledema, and you know that that is always important, and I'll speak about that in just a moment. The second is obviously infarction of the optic disc, which creates swelling of the, of the, of the axons in the optic disc and in the extracellular space. And ischemic optic neuropathy, as you know, comes in two varieties, and surely you know about that, and we'll probably hear more about that in other uh, talks in this webinar series. The third cause is inflammation, and that generally goes under the rubric of optic neuritis, neuroretinitis, and posterior uveitis. Keep in mind that posterior uveitis is certainly a cause of inflammation of the optic disc, which is right in the middle of the action. The fourth cause is infiltration, and you can see that I have rather poetically tried to make all of these causes begin with the letter I as a way of helping you remember. Infiltration of the optic disc is caused by cancer and also by protein in this condition known in English as poem syndrome. The fifth cause is indentation, and you can see I'm stretching things a little bit to keep the eyes here. Uh, and that would be by a compressive mass in the orbit or the optic canal. That is where you will get most of your, the swelling of the optic disc, either in the, proxim or the, the distal orbit near the globe or in the optic canal where there is no uh, room for, for stretching uh, of, the, of the mass. All right, and then number six is inherited, and that would be labor hereditary optic neuropathy. It produces optic disc swelling as well. Usually the swelling is not in the disc itself, but in the peripapillary axonal layer. Increased blood pressure, well, yes. Uh, malignant uh, systemic hypertension produces vasogenic edema of the optic disc. And although it isn't very prominent and certainly much less prominent than the retinal abnormalities, it is a cause of acquired optic disc elevation and needs to be recognized. Number eight is increased venous retinal venous pressure, which comes from a retinal vein occlusion. And there again, you will see much more prominent retinal findings. And that's the clue that this problem is emanating from the retinal veins. Well, the last one I couldn't get under an eye. This one is decreased intraocular pressure. And you, I think, are familiar with the fact that ocular hypotony can cause in elevation of the optic disc. All right, let's move on now to step number three. And the question here is, you, is whether this could be papilledema. And the, the question I have for you is, how do you decide? 
And we teach that there are two ways that you should be able to distinguish papilledema. Number one, papilledema is usually binocular and symmetrical in the two eyes. And you know that that rule is violated, but basically it is a rule. And if you uh, are seeing a monocular uh, disc elevation or markedly asymmetric elevation, you have to question whether it's papilledema. The other th and very important feature is that papilledema by its very nature allows visual function to be relatively preserved, especially visual acuity, uh, unless there are two features of the papilledema that are present and they are, number one, that the papilledema has become atrophic. That is that the axons have died and as a result, the optic disc uh, is no longer um, providing visual function. And that would be an exception to the rule that papilledema preserves visual function. And here's an example of optic discs that are simply destroyed from longstanding axoplasmic stasis. All right, the second uh, rule is, or the second uh, feature is that papilledema, when it is very severe, can cause vision loss, either because the axons are no longer working, still present, but not working, and fluid has leaked from the optic disc into the macula, and that causes a disturbance of vision. So those are the two things to keep in mind when you are trying to distinguish papilledema as the cause of acquired optic disc elevation. And here is a picture of that kind of very horrid papilledema that can give rise to a retinal cause of, of uh, vision loss or where the axons have been so badly damaged that the vision is no longer preserved. All right, step number four is always the question of how quickly must you refer a patient with papilledema? And the answer to that, I think you all know, and that is as soon as possible. And the reason for that is that papilledema uh, is, um, has many serious underlying causes which require prompt diagnosis and treatment. In some cases, the treatment does not have to be uh, emergent, but certainly the patient feels that it ought to be. So you have to Keep that in mind. Now, here are the causes of papilledema. A comment about each one. I believe idiopathic intracranial hypertension uh, requires no explanation. You're quite familiar with it. It's pretty much the ophthalmologist papilledema. Brain mass effect certainly can cause it. You know, brain tumors or hemorrhages or subdural hematomas can certainly do this, but generally speaking, they have to be quite large before they will produce papilledema unless they are also obstructing uh, ventricular uh, outflow, uh, in which case uh, they can be, if properly situated, uh, where they're blocking the outflow of cerebrospinal fluid, then yes, they can certainly uh, be small and cause papilledema. The fourth cause is dural venous sinus obstruction, which is something you must not forget. It's a very effective cause of increased intracranial pressure. If you block the venous outflow to the brain, you will get papilledema. Meningoencephalitis uh, can be indolent, it can be chronic and not very symptomatic. And that's one of the reasons why uh, lumbar puncture is so often performed in patients with papilledema. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, head injury, neck mass, and spinal cord tumor. Those are com less common causes for ophthalmologists, but they're always in the mix when it comes to thinking about papilledema. Spinal cord tumor is a very odd and, and rare cause but you have to consider it. And so is a neck mass, because again, the veins have to drain through the neck and you have to keep that in mind. Very often, uh, the imaging that is done for papilledema does not include these two features. And so it, it, they, it'll be, the diagnosis will be missed. All right, if it's not papilledema, what else could it be? And I'm, I've listed the conditions here and I've bolded the ones that you really have to have at the top of your list. Obviously, arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy which we uh, generally know as giant cell arteritis, that diagnosis has to be made immediately. Non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy is a common cause of unilateral or bilateral optic disc elevation. That diagnosis is not urgent, but certainly the distinction between number one and number two is one that you have to make. We are thinking more and more these days about atypical optic neuritis with the discovery of MOG and NMO, and occasionally you can see quite a, a deal of optic disc elevation in these conditions. And the thinking nowadays is that early treatment may be important. 
Infiltration by cancer is a diagnosis you don't want to miss because uh, patients will certainly hold it against you if there has been a delay in diagnosis, even if, uh, medically speaking, the, the uh, diagnosis is not urgent. Orbital compressive lesions, we've talked about before, they can certainly be causes usually unilateral, but in Graves' disease, bilateral optic disc elevation. And there again, diagnosis is important and urgent. Posterior uveitis, don't, don't forget posterior uveitis as a cause. Central retinal vein occlusion, we've talked about. Acute systemic hypertension, this is something that really can be very dangerous to the patient. Labor hereditary optic neuropathy and POEM syndrome. These are the somewhat less common causes. Okay, now what else looks like papilledema? And there are two main uh, things that I've boxed for you here that you must keep in mind as being difficult to distinguish from papilledema. And here you can see, just by looking at the optic disc, there would be no way for you to know that this isn't papilledema, and this happens to be ischemic optic neuropathy. So keep in mind that that's ophthalmoscopically a very difficult distinction. And what about this one? This is papillitis or optic neuritis. You know, the optic disc has only a limited number of, or limited repertoire for what it can display to you. So what I would say to you about this is do not depend on ophthalmoscopy alone rely on history and visual function measurements in your distinction between papilledema and other causes of the acquired swollen optic disc. All right, so I've come to the end and uh, I wanna summarize these points for you and leave plenty of time for questions and discussion. So point number one is distinguish congenital from acquired optic disc elevation. That is very important. If you shove everybody into the same workup, you're going to be doing an, an awful lot of unnecessary testing of patients with, this, with the elevated optic disc. Number two, decide if you need ancillary imaging to confirm a congenital cause. I would say that most ophthalmologists are in the habit of getting ancillary testing because they're not sure, they're not confident. I think that's perfectly reasonable. I think the more experience you have with this, the more you can get away with not doing ancillary imaging. It has become quite convenient nowadays to just get OCT, and I think that's perfectly acceptable. If you think you can do it without it, then for sure, skip that step. If it's acquired and you really think that it is acquired, you have certain things on the top of your list. Obviously, papilledema is very important, but also arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy and atypical optic neuritis. Those are the big three, and I would say uh, in pretty much in that order, although arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, your job is to prevent further vision loss and other systemic consequences, so early diagnosis, absolutely critical. The fourth point is that papilledema requires prompt imaging. You cannot delay the diagnosis, even though the, the, it may not be, it may be idiopathic intracranial hypertension of, of rather chronic duration, and not in need of urgent diagnosis, but you don't know that uh, beforehand. Uh, we typically say that CT scan is a nice screening tool, but MRI scan is what you really need here. So it's gonna be getting the patient to the scanner, to the MRI scanner as soon as possible, which might mean through an emergency room. And then the next point is that arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy requires immediate steroid treatment and biopsy. At least in the United States, we always uh, entertain uh, and perform a biopsy in these patients for confirmation. I know that in Europe that is not always done, but uh, at least here it is. And finally, atypical optic neuritis could be MOG. It could also be NMO, although MOG is somewhat more likely. And I believe you're going to be hearing more about these, these uh, newer forms uh, or more newly recognized forms of atypical optic neuritis. There are other forms of atypical optic neuritis besides MOG that you need to know about and uh, again, uh, need to pursue the workup and get on it relatively quickly. So that is all I have to say to you. Um, I hope this has been informative and that you've learned a little something and I look forward to, uh, to hearing your, your feedback.